Ready. Hey. Just in the middle of the field, 45, 50. Green grass in front of him, leaving Lions in his way. I am Jeff Joniak. Blitz is on. <laughs> Down he goes. Brisker. What was it like playing for Coach Dicka? Uh, I don't want to answer any questions like that. 61 yards. A Sunday stroll for Justin Fields. Oh, wow. And ta-da, and ta-da, and ta-da. Now, Bears Etc. Brought to you by Miller Lite with the voices of the Bears, Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer. With the NFL down to its final four, it's a good time to discuss where the Bears are at in the big picture and a lot of news to discuss as well. With Super Bowl winning Bears guard Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Choniak. We welcome you in once again to the Bears Etc. podcast for episode 52. And we are brought to you by Miller Lite. Thank you for your sponsorship, Miller Lite, and thank you for listening, everybody. Tom, how you feeling? Feeling good, Jeff. Uh, trivia question for you. Do you know who number 52 on the Super Bowl team was? Tom Andrews? No, not even close. <laughs> Cliff Thrift. I would have never got it. <laughs> He's a special teamer that came aboard that year from the San Diego Chargers. Uh, had a good long career and was fortunate to hook on to the right team at the right year. Oh, yeah. There was uh, more than a handful of guys that probably people don't even remember on that Super Bowl team, but everybody had a hand in it in some way. They, they got you ready during practice. He was a great special teams player, but he was also a great experienced linebacker super dedicated to the sport and um i think in trying to go find free agents of that era he was a real asset to the to the locker room now one of the assets to the bears number 62 on the bears all-time 100 list kicker robbie gold is going to join us a special guest we discuss kickers tom's favorite topic in the nfl <laughs> oh I mean, my gosh you talk about a playoff weekend wow. and the role that the kickers had this weekend mm. and you know, when you think about a guy like Robbie, you're talking about a guy that has a, a Hall of Fame caliber type career. Yep. And then you're talking about the big kicks that he made with the Bears and the San Francisco 49ers. But it's really interesting to get into the mind of a kicker, uh, the, the emotions that goes into a guy going back into the locker room after having a big playoff miss. And one thing about as an offensive lineman, I can watch a player, I can watch an offensive lineman, and I can watch him get beat on a play, and I can tell you exactly what he did wrong. I'm interested to see if Robbie Gold can tell us exactly what the kicker did wrong and the Buffalo miss that I'm talking about, and is it something that they can break down as easily as we can break down our own position? Yeah, and it'd be an interesting question indeed. The pressures of the postseason. And, you know, we have to always link it to the idea, though, that not one play – uh, ruins the outcome of a game, it, it, but it's the last thing you see. So it's it's hard to flush it for a fan, no question. You know, when you, when you look at the history of failed kicks for the Buffalo Bills mm -hmm. and what they mean in turn in terms of their playoff or Super Bowl significance, it's it's pretty incredible. Because then you look at Adam Vinatieri and some of the kicks that he made in some of the worst conditions yeah. in New England and what it meant to their Super Bowl success. So. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible just that instance in football time yep. that it can come down to a snap placement kick, and is it good or wide right, wide left, or short? News on the Bears offensive coordinator hire, Tom. Uh, it's going to be Shane Waldron, the Seattle Seahawks offensive coordinator of the last three years. And if you go back to the uh, season-ending news conference with general manager Ryan Poles and head coach Matt Eberflus, you kind of got the idea by the look in his eye, especially Ryan, that – uh, this was going to be a, a, a wide search. They did cast a wide net. I pulled a quote from that uh, news conference, and this was Ryan, quote, we're going to turn over every stone to make sure we're going to make a sound decision for our organization. You expect organizations to do that on the regular, but they, they had some interesting candidates. Nine known interviews, according to all the reports that we heard, many tied to the branches, of that Sean McFay uh, West Coast offense, along with Kyle Shanahan. Different coaches on there that, you know, Eberflus faced in his career. Uh, many of those guys in, in particular games. Also, some from the same tree. Many of them from the same tree. Different styles and, and, and different quarterbacks they worked with. So, I, I'm sure they collected a heck of a lot of information moving forward. Right. It, but, it, you know, the thing about it is whatever decision you went out there and made and investigated, it's not a singular decision because there's so many tentacles to this decision that you're going to make about offensive coordinator in terms of the quarterback position, where it's going or where it's at. 
You're talking about the different different assets you have on the offensive side of the ball. DJ Moore and Cole Komet will start with those two. And then where you're going to go with this offense. So um, you understand what you face in the uh, terms of the de- defenses inside this division. But it's about, uh, you know, how the offensive, the new offensive coordinator feels about the talent they ha- have here and what talent does he need to, you know, put his offense in the best possible position to succeed. Game day snacking calls for good foods, chunky guacamole made with Haas avocados, tomatoes, onions, cilantro, and a squeeze of lime juice. It's the perfect snack to watch while the Bears win. Score some today at your local grocery store because game day is guac day. Jeff and Tom of the Bears, etc. podcast. So uh, what I had been hoping for was a coordinator with experience, game experience in, in the in the in the NFL in particular. So that's where they got a guy with a lot of experience calling plays for three years for two different quarterbacks, or I guess I should say three different quarterbacks when you factor in Russell Wilson, uh, Drew Locke, and of course Geno Smith. And Geno Smith had an amazing turnaround of his career. Uh, with Shane Waldron calling his plays, uh, Pro Bowl year, uh, comeback player of the year, high completion percentage. I went back also, something that may be lost in all the uh, minutiae of statistical analysis on how you're going to look at what Waldron and what he liked to call and whatever. It is about personnel, uh, number one. Uh, will he adjust it? Will will this be that much different of an offense than what the Bears had with Luke Getze? Those things we'll all get into, but for the sake of just this discussion on uh, the veteran quarterback and a nine-year veteran at that in Geno Smith. The, the the last two years, he's had eight game-winning comebacks in the fourth quarter, game-winning drives with this offensive coordinator, which is significant. That is a part, a part of playing quarterback in this league, and that's where you get a lot of your wins, and you squeeze out wins, whether it be road uh, come from behind wins or in your own building. So I thought that was a significant statistic, Tommy. Oh, it's incredible because you think of what has escaped the Bears the most this season yep. that um, they failed to convert some of these opportunities into wins. And if you take a couple of those wins and you a couple of those fourth quarter battles and you convert them into wins, you're talking about a playoff football team. So it's a significant what you need – that offensive coordinator and his thinking process and how he understands his offense well enough that he knows what can go out there and challenge the opponent's defense is the best. And then when you look at the conference that he's just come from, it's a heck of a football conference. Oh, yeah. And you have to coach at your best in order to go into that conference and compete. So, uh, and the, that division. So I, I think it, um, there's a lot of instruments of development for Shane Waldron factor in, in in his developmental process of becoming a coach in the NFL. And and I believe this to be true also because I went back and listened to his acceptance uh, interview uh, press conference when he took the Seattle offensive coordinator job and he mentioned balance, which, you know, in today's world, you can't count on an offensive coordinator wanting balance. It's sometimes just an aerial show. Uh, so I like the balance because this team did lead the NFL in rushing the last uh, last year, uh, number one, this past season, number two. Again, a lot of that rushing quarterback numbers as well. Uh, but that's important. And he uh, prioritized the adaptability aspect of things in the search uh, from Matt Eberflew's mouth because you never know who your quarterback's going to be on any given week because of injuries and whatnot. And, and he proved that. He proved that in Seattle working with multiple quarterbacks and with multiple receivers uh, injuries galore up there in Seattle last couple of years. So uh, a lot of things like that also stick out to me. You got to have some balance in there. Yeah. You know, Jeff, when you keep bringing up the word balance, I also have to throw the offensive line in there because if you want to talk about balance, then the ability to run and pass and be equally as effective at it, you have an, you have to have an offensive line that's good at both of those requirements. So no matter what the quarterback position, we know, you kind of know what you have at the receiver position and what it's capable of, although you're going to have some holes to fill there. you got to have that versatile offensive line that when you need it to be physical in the fourth quarter to close out a quarter, they can do that. They can run the ball. If you need to play catch up and you got to throw the ball with a little bit more frequency in the fourth quarter, you have to have an offensive line that does that as well. So I think when you talk about Chris Morgan being retained and when they do bring in a new offensive coordinator, 
that line of communication has to open instantly because you're not going to have balance if you only have a good quarterback. You're going to have balance if you have an offensive line that's capable of doing both. Interesting, too, the people he's worked with in his career. I would say all of them are strong coaching personalities. Uh, Bill Belichick, Sean McVay, Pete Carroll. He was a grad assistant at Notre Dame uh, for Charlie Weiss. He's worked with quarterbacks like Kirk Cousins, uh, Jared Goff, Russell Wilson, and, of course, Geno Smith. So, uh, And he's represented by Trace Armstrong, uh, who's also representing Ryan Poles and, and Matt Eberflus, which is not that uncommon anymore in this, in this sport. But uh, those are all in- interesting levels of intrigue for me. How about you? You talk about an offensive coordinator that's been able to call plays, develop an offense, and look at a bunch of different quarterbacks and their styles – and what fits them best, what is the most challenging to some of these quarterbacks, and how do some of them thrive. And to me, I'm most impressed with the job that he's done with Geno Smith because when I'm on the outside looking in and I'm never that close to Geno Smith, I was kind of curious where his career was going. Then all of a sudden they have a quarterback trade, they have a a first rounder that really didn't develop up into the standards that they thought he would, and then Geno Smith uh, kind of burst back on the scene. Yeah, how about 4,200 yards and 30 touchdowns? Right, that's what I'm yeah. saying, bursting onto the scene. He had a great year. And so of, of anybody and all the, you know, the versatile and the different coaches, you know, from the guys that are kind of stable and set in their ways like Bill Belichick to the guys like McVay that are a little bit more young school and creative, I, I like all that. But when you can take a quarterback and allow that quarterback and you can develop his confidence again and let him know that he can come back and be as effective as any quarterback in his division, that impresses me as much as anything. And, and in a passing game coordinator for a team that went to the Super Bowl with the Rams. So you need that champion. you got to figure out at some point, you got to have guys on your team that knew how to get to the Super Bowl as a player and certainly there as a coach. I think that's valuable experience as well. Yeah, and you know, listen, th- like we mentioned, they have stars on the team like DJ Moore and Cole Komet, and I think Roshan Johnson has the ability to be a star at the running back position. But you're going to have to bring in some of those other elements of offensive success, and you're going to be able to de- you're going to have to develop them along the way. And so that's when you need the experience of an offensive coordinator that's coached in a variety of ways on the offensive side of the ball, from a passing coordinator to the different types of offenses he's coached in. Because you know this offseason, as much as we want to talk about the high-profile quarterback position, there's a lot of other parts of this offense that needs to be uh, continue to be um, built up to the standards so this offense can stay as effective as it can be. Yeah, and I was also glad to see as many candidates because I'm certain there were a number of people that uh, were interested in this position. It's the Chicago Bears, number one. It's uh, an enviable situation potentially at the quarterback position with Justin Fields and still with the number one pick to figure out what you're going to do Uh, I know people want to read tea leaves, what this decision means for who's going to be here, who's not. Uh, That's irrelevant right now. you got to figure out what you want to do as a football franchise and sort all that out. So very pleased with uh, that process and as it winds down here. Tastes like Miller time. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. Our fine friends at Miller Lite. Sponsoring the Bears, etc. podcast version 52. All right, a couple notes, Tommy. You'll be happy to hear that Darnell Wright, uh, the starting right tackle, the rookie right tackle named to the Pro Football Writers of America, uh, all-rookie team. Great recognition for him. And Jalen Johnson was uh, that same organization's all-NFC team cornerback. Yeah, well, I, I think we talked to Jim Miller, and he's got a vote in the, you know, the all-star teams of the postseason, and he voted for Jalen Johnson, which is nice. But to me, you know, being an ex-offensive lineman and seeing a guy that makes uh, get some uh, postseason accolades a- after your rookie year, I want to see Darnell Wright stack these seasons one on top of another. Because when I look at a guy like Darnell Wright, you think of the quick learner he is, what uh, you know, how good of an athlete he is. I would like to see him have multiple postseason recognition throughout his whole career. 
Here on the Bears Etc. podcast, we're pleased to welcome our old friend and outstanding place kicker, one of the best in NFL history, undrafted off that construction site to the Bears and a Hall of Fame career. Uh, Robbie Gold joining Tom and I here on episode 52. Thanks for taking the time, Robbie. How are you feeling? Uh, everything's great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's been a long time since I've been able to do this with you two guys. So uh, obviously love listening to you guys on the radio, but always enjoy sitting down with you guys. Yeah, uh, and, and when it comes to playoff football, kickers become a topic. So we had to – Tom had these great ideas about let's let's pry into the mind of a kicker because you had so many clutch kicks – but the most interesting and amazing stat line that can ever be put together, I don't know that there's one like it of any any kind. I did my research. I don't. I can't find it. But uh, Robbie Gold, perfect in the postseason and field goals made and extra points made. It's an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Twenty nine to twenty nine, thirty nine to thirty nine, one hundred twenty six points in sixteen games, and you are nine and seven. That's a season. You, you had a whole season of playoff excellence. The mind of a kicker and how that has to factor in everything. This is what we want to explore today with you. And now we give you the baton to explain how the hell did you do it? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to wanting to be a competitor. You know, I think there's a misnomer that uh, kickers aren't a part of the team or if it comes down to them. I, you know, I always looked at kickers as being like relief pitchers. Uh, Mario Rivera, Mariano Rivera was one of the greatest closers of all time. Um, and sure they pitched a lot, don't get me wrong, but you know, I, I grew up as a Michael Jordan fan and couldn't wait to be in the driveway three, two, one shooting the last shot and, you know, wanting to be that competitor. So I think the mindset of a kicker is you have to be a competitor first. Um, I think, you know, when, when you're going to draft a young kid or you're, when you're looking to, you know, go in a younger direction, which the national football league is doing, um, and you see a lot of the older guys being put on practice squads or being asked to take league minimums, you know, this is what you get, what you pay for. Right. And, um, I think a lot of that of what happened and what's unfolded over the the first couple weeks of, um, the postseason is exactly that. Right. I mean, green Bay thought, I think, Hey, we're in a, this position where we're going to, try to rebuild this team. Uh, we, we, we secured Jordan love for a couple of years. Uh, we can go draft a young kicker and, and use that to take care of some of our own, which normally green Bay does. Um, and he, you know, he, he struggled in the preseason. He kind of found lightning in a bottle a little bit throughout the year, finished the season really strong. And then, you know, missed an extra point against Dallas and then missed a key field goal against uh, green Bay. Uh, in the 49ers game Uh, and you know one kick in the playoffs whether it's an extra point or whether it's a field goal really changes the mentality of of a of an offensive coordinator but also changes the mentality of a game Um, if if he makes that kick they now go up seven they're living to fight another day they're living to go to overtime or maybe they block the kick who knows Um, you go to the Tyler Bass kick that by far is to be the the hardest kick I've seen uh, in the playoffs yet right hash got to kick it the whole way to the left upright Dave Tobe who was a Chicago Bears coordinator for a long time did a great job of rushing through the the wing right down the middle of them so that the the edge rusher could collapse the pocket to not allow him to swing out there and kind of make his momentum uh, go more down the field as opposed to across the field so you know, there's a lot more that goes into this than just hey the ball gets snapped it gets put <laughs> down and, and it gets placed but you know, you talk about the playoff stats, you have to have a lot of guys buy in. You know, it's 11 people on, on a field goal unit. And uh, I always just looked at it as though, you know, every time, whether it's regular season or postseason, you got to make the kicks because that's the difference in, in winning and losing. And you're seeing a lot of that, not only this year, but, you know, throughout the, the course of the season. Hey, Robbie, so when you watch a replay of the kick by Bass, uh, as an ex-offensive lineman, as I see an offensive lineman get beat and give up a sack, I can see exactly what he did wrong. When you watch the fundamentals of a kicker and you see his foot follow through, do you know exactly what he did wrong? Yeah, you can see kind of the whole picture, right? I think if you look at that kick, it was similar to the one in Green Bay that I had a couple years ago, but there was more wind. So I knew if I played it anywhere left of the upright, left center, he, he had to for sure hit that at the left upright. Um, if you look at the rush, if you look at what they're going to do, uh, you know, Tobe's a very experienced special teams coordinator. So 
um, as that rush collapses on your side and you're trying to kick it across an entire formation, you can see him just get skinnier because of the rush and he hits it to the, to the right center of the upright, which that's going to miss outside. So in order for him to make that, if he hits it left center, I think it sneaks in the right upright, right? I mean, it's the, that's the margin of error that you have to do your research in the pregame warmup is, and, and I will say this, that game with the Bills, um, I think the wind was swirling a lot there because there's not a lot in the Buffalo Stadium that um, allows you to kind of condense the wind and block, knock it down like some places. But um, that's what you go into pregame warm up and find out how far the ball is going left to right or uh, right to left. And, you know, that's a kick that you have to hit towards the left upright. You can probably kick it even outside the upright. And then um, – he probably makes it, if you go outside the left upright, he's probably making it inside the left third of the upright. You know, Robbie, you think of the full operation of a kicker um, from the snap, hold, placement, plant foot, follow through. But you kind of kicked in probably the two of the worst field conditions in, in the NFL. When they opened up San Francisco Stadium, their turf was awful. When they had the old turf at Soldier Field, it wasn't a, you know considered the best in the league. Of, of those two, was did did anything help you be prepared for San Francisco for kicking in Chicago, or is every single stadium, like you just mentioned, a, a different animal? Well, let's talk about the field first. San Francisco did an amazing job. You know, when they opened up the stadium, they had a certain set of turf that they were using. Uh, you know, late in the year against uh, probably – December, January, you're going to get a lot of rain in San Francisco. Um, so they end up changing suppliers for their turf, similar to what Chicago did uh, two years ago, where they went to, I think, more of like a southeastern U.S. type of turf. Um, and I remember when we played the 49ers uh, in, in Chicago, it was a torrential downpour, and the field actually held up extremely well. So uh, I, I would say this first. I think the turf management groups are doing a great job of communicating together as a, as from team to team, but also based on, you know, where we are uh, in the U S at what times we're going to be growing. How would you resod? How many times do you, do you resod throughout the year? Uh, I also think that the national football league and the NFL Pierre are doing a great job of setting standards, which, you know, Tom, you know, those really didn't exist back in the day. Uh, right. So you're seeing these field standards that are being uh, upheld. Um, you know, when I went to San Francisco, I was pumped because I was like, man, this is going to be awesome. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be sunny. Uh, you know, the way that the stadium's built in San Francisco, that wind does not do the same thing like Chicago does the entire game. So once you have a game plan and pregame in Chicago, you can just go with it and you know what exactly what it's going to do. In San Francisco, a kick in the third quarter that you had in the first quarter might be completely different. So you have to be really good at understanding there how to feel the wind uh, throughout the game and, and, and remember what that was like in pregame warm-ups or whatever that kick was that you had previous uh, because you'll feel a distinct difference on how that, that kick is supposed to go. Robbie Gold, our guest here on Bears Etc. with Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak. Uh, let, let's talk about... Uh, the games now outdoors, these two NFC and AFC championship games, because, you know, I think a lot of people hope that one day there are no more outdoor games. Like they just want (laughs) indoor football, but this is the beauty of this sport. It is elements factor, a home field and making a kicker kick in circumstances they're, they're not used to. That's a part of the game. Uh, Obviously the bulk of your career in outdoor, all of it in outdoor stadiums as the home team. Yeah. All of it. Um, Would it, would it, would it mess with the game in a way that is unfortunate if that ever happened where everybody just has indoor facilities because it's great for the fans. They don't have to deal with the elements. The players are on an even playing surface, et cetera. You know, I think it's what makes the game, the game. I think it's what makes the NFL, the NFL. I think, you know, if you look at how teams have to build a roster, you know, look at Justin Tucker and, and Harrison Bucker. You're talking about the two greatest kickers to play in the game right now. Right. I mean, but those teams know where they play in Kansas City and Baltimore and how they run the football or how they're scoring points at Kansas City. You have to have a really, really good uh, field goal kicker. Now, if you look at it, how they, you know, go further down the road from that, like Kansas City probably has a little bit of the edge on the punter in Baltimore because, you know, he's a, 
a pro bowler. He's got a really strong leg. The other guy is really good, but he's a little bit younger. Um, you know, if you look at Baltimore in general, like they got a really good running game with, with Lamar Jackson and they'll be able to do some things against Kansas city, uh, in the run game, uh, to help their offense. And Lamar's passing at a, at a very high, highly accurate level. So, uh, I think if you look at the elements, um, I think it's going to be a part of the game plan. You always look at that when you're playing them cold area places or outdoor places. Uh, but listen, Buffalo is electric the last two weeks and they had 40 inches of snow. I mean, I think it just becomes a part of your culture, right? We talk about when I played in Chicago, you talk about bear weather. Like my wife and I took our kids to the Atlanta Falcons game and it was snowing. It was sleeting. I looked at my wife. I'm like, I can't believe I'm sitting in the stands watching this because this is what I used to have to play in. Right. But I think like that's the beauty of, of those type of places is it's part of who, you are as a city, it's a part of who you are as an organization, and you have to build your team to be to be ready for those moments and, and those conditions. Well, some of the greatest games in NFL history, Tom, of which you were part of plenty as well, the elements were, you know, it's something that lives forever in NFL film. Think about Adam Vinatieri's kicks. Think about the Fog Bowl. Think about the yeah. kicks in, in the NFC Championship. Uh, think about think about New Orleans game at Soldier Field, uh, Robbie in 06. I mean, so many, so many of these. It'd be a shame if if I, I just think it just it adds to the lore of this unbelievable sport. For right sure, down. and you know, listen, if you look at New York, held a, they held a Super Bowl, right. and it was a gorgeous day. It was 50 degrees, 45 degrees in New York. Who would have thought that was going to happen? Right now, here you are hosting it because you have a brand new facility in, in the new Meadowlands. Uh, and the next day there's 15 inches of snow and no one can get out of New York city. <laughs> you know, you have a super bowl in Minnesota. Sure. It's a dome, but there's so many things that go into the festivities of a, of a super bowl. I think it's really unique to be able to see, um, how the fans come out and, and, and how, uh, everybody endures those, of those conditions. Hey Robbie. So you're talking about outdoor games this week and, are kickers talented enough to kick it, keep it in the field of play? Say you have a, cha- a guy you want to challenge their kick return ability. Can they um, ride that fine line of banging it into the end zone or keeping it into the field of play? You can, but the new rules, it's really, it's really interesting. When you can fair catch a kickoff now, you take that completely out of it. So where that. you once used to I, – I hate it too, I think – you know, it, it's kind of interesting. You know, I understand the health and safety part of it. I get it, right? But I also believe, like, there's a distinct difference. If you go and look at certain teams, you know, some teams have really, really, really good returners who change the game, and they're not going to want to challenge them. And that's where the kickers have become really good is that, you know, they have these strong legs and play. If you look at the guys playing in Buffalo last week, they're hitting touchbacks because they're riding the wind right to left or left to right. It really wasn't in their face a ton. Um, but then you go and look at a team like Dave Tobe, they pin him a yard from the sideline, which is a great kick. And you can't get that ball to bounce like a counter action. Um, and you have to take it right back up the field. You lose field position. They've completely taken that out of the game. And I think to me, I think kickers are good enough to do that. I, I think, uh, Tucker Harrison Bucker, um, you know, those guys are the guys that are really good and that would and listen, Harbaugh is a special teams guy. You know, I think that would be so fun to watch Dave Tobe and Harbaugh kind of go at it because they've they've known each other for years. You know, it, it, it's there's just a lot of things I think people would love to see. Um, and it just to me, it just takes it out of the game. You know, in the last couple of weeks, Trenton Gill, the punter for the Bears, he was kicking off at times, and he was doing a nice job banging him into the end zone. If if punters can kick, can kickers punt? They can, but it's not as easy, uh, I would say, to transition from to punting. I think you can do it, but the swings are way different. Uh, when you're putting, you're kind of swinging across your body, uh, more vertical. Uh, I think field goal kicking, you know, the, the, the path is more inside out um, and more of a wrap. So you're not going to see a lot of guys. I think Michael Kanan was the last guy to do it in, 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 in Atlanta. Uh, he punted and kicked off in the beginning of the season and he didn't make as many field goals, I think. And they just transitioned him to being a punter only. 
Um, I think the game's too specialized now. I think, you know, if you look at Trenton, he's a big dude. He's probably, what, 6'4", 6'5". Uh, has a really good kickoff leg. He reminds me a lot of Bradley Pinion, who I had in San Francisco, uh, who's now in Atlanta. Um, I also think that, you know, it's interesting. You know, if you look at the Chicago Bears, they just re-signed Cairo. Uh, I think Cairo's 36 years old. It was very similar to when I was in San Francisco. You know, if Trenton can do that and manage to punt really well, uh, I think it would be a great idea for them to, to extend uh, Cairo's career by having Trenton kick off for him. Uh, I also think it would make him a probably fresher to hit longer kicks too and extend his range. So uh, I think if Trenton can come back and have a, a solid year punting, I know it was kind of an up-and-down year for him. But if he can come back and, and be able to manage both, uh, you know, I think it's great that they have Cairo who can do it in the beginning of the year um, and help. And then obviously you saw Trenton do that against uh, Atlanta with one of the most prolific returners next to Devin Hester uh, in the history of the football game. And Cordell Patterson, Robbie Gold, uh, what is the favorite kick of your career? Oh man, you can, really only, can, pick you know, uh, you can only can pick one. Only can pick one. Has to be has um, to be clutch too. Here, here's. Here's what I'll say. I think my favorite kick of all time uh, as a Chicago Bear is the San, uh, the Seattle game at home. Uh, you know, I think if you look at what that meant, not only to that organization, because we hadn't won a playoff game in like 11 years, uh, you know, it, it was that team was so good. We had the best running game in, in the National Football League that year. We had three – three Pro Bowl special teams players, which truly we probably had more than that. You just couldn't – you only have one special teams player in the NFC that was able to go to the Pro Bowl as a special teams player. Um, defensively, I mean, that group was was really good. The only unfortunate thing I would say is that we just didn't finish the task uh, by winning the Super Bowl against Peyton Manning. Um, and then the only other one I would put up there, just because I think um, – I love the rivalry against Green Bay – uh, that kick that I had for San Francisco, right. not only did it make San Francisco uh, fans excited, but it was awesome to watch how the Chicago fans uh, rallied around that kick. And, I mean, listen, yeah, I'm a Chicago Bear. There's no doubt about it. But yeah. it was cool to be able to come home and, and just see uh, how much the hatred is for that for that <laughs> team up north. You know what I mean? 45 yards as time expired in a very raucous uh, Robbie Gold, for sure. <laughs> We loved it. We loved it indeed. But uh, that put the uh, 49ers in the NFC Championship. So you announced your retirement early last month. Uh, even after that, did you get phone calls? Did you get phone calls throughout the yeah, season? I mean, listen, and did you give were... it a hard thought? And even after you retired, did you get phone calls? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's funny. Like, we were getting phone calls all the time. You know, I just, for me, I just, you know, I, to give you kind of a shape of how this offseason went, there was one team I was really looking for to go to, uh, in the beginning of free agency. Um, and, and that team, uh, ended up having a really good kicker this year uh, as a young kicker. Uh, but I held out as long as I could to, to go to that team, probably too long, frankly. Um, but it would have, I thought extended my career. It would have done some things for me to give me a chance, uh, to play some high level football. Um, and then, you know, we, as the season gets going, you know, teams are calling all the time, you know, it's just one of those situations where, you know, it becomes a risk versus reward. It becomes a conversation of who's calling. I mean, we had teams call up and even to the playoffs. Uh, so, you know, there's, you have to look at this from, you know, a bigger picture and a bigger view. Um, and I, I felt like um, the more that I stayed home and I kind of knew this going into free agency, the more that I was around my family and my kids. Uh, and it's funny, like my, I, I didn't miss playing football during the season. The playoffs come, <laughs> yeah. and I have a totally yeah. different right. feeling on uh, – like sitting on the couch and watching playoff football is different than watching the National Football League week one through 17. Like I know I could still play, and I could play at a high level. That wasn't the point. The point was was the economics uh, and or the situation that you're walking into from a holder uh, and a uh, long snapper are going to make – that legacy continue to grow. And I just didn't find there was a place for me that everything matched up. Um, and then even to the end of the end of the season, the last four or five weeks after I announced my retirement, it was funny because probably more teams called then to pull me out of retirement 
And by then I had already made the decision. You know, I, I, it was a long conversation with my wife. It was a long conversation with uh, people that, you know, I trust and, and are near and dear to me to, to make the right decision. Um, you know, it was, it's just a playoff for I could, right. if I could suit up tomorrow and play and someone called me, even though I know I had that opportunity, man, I had, there, there would definitely be a conversation I'd have to have with my wife on like, Hey, does this make sense to do it? And my agents. And I mean, it's, it was weird. Like, I, you know, we had teams call, Hey, do you want to come in for two weeks and kick? And I was like, yeah, no, not really. Like, yeah. And then I went, it's, it's just part of it. There's everyone says in, in this, this retirement space is you'll kind of know when you're done. And yeah. I kind of knew that this was a decision that I was very comfortable making. And then the playoffs get here and I'm like, are you kidding me? Did you, <laughs> you did know? you, did you practice field goal kicking at all since the day you retired? No. And actually it was funny. I, I stopped. I, I got the call to go to the giants. Um, and I've been kicking a lot. Uh, I had been ready to go to certain places in the beginning of the season. You know, it's kind of funny. Like the first two months you're turning down teams because they're not, uh, well, I'll say Super Bowl contenders, right? Because truly like that's to me, even though I played in two Super Bowls, I played in five NFC championships. Uh, you know, my, I covet a Super Bowl win. Like I just, there's something to that. Right. Um, so as the season kind of went on, I went to the Giants. I went and kicked to the Giants. I kicked okay. You know, I did some things there that I thought were really good field goal-wise, kickoff-wise. I didn't kick as well as I would have liked to probably kick off. Um, but, you know, I, I got done in New York, and I was like, man, I can still do this, and I can play at a decent, decent level. I can play a high level of field goals. But I got home, and I was just like, you know what, like, I just, this isn't meant for me anymore. I have a better, I have a better understanding of like, I wish Tom, I don't know if you were this way, but I wish I would have enjoyed the moments more when I played. Cause I, I look back now and you get so used to the grind. You get so used right. to the day to day. You know, it's funny. I don't, I don't miss the game. I miss the people. I miss the camaraderie of walking into a support staff or that's the equipment manager, the trainers, you know, having that daily social interaction, I think, is, is a big deal. And that's, like, the biggest thing I would say that you miss. And then after that, it's, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have my kids around to watch me play and be in the locker room with me. And, and you know, I played until I was 40, 41 years old. So, like, you know, it wasn't like I played five years and I'm missing out on, like, not playing because I didn't play 100 games. It was, to me, it was just, it, that's the part I miss the most. I miss the people. Yeah, you know, I, I just think you get to a point where there's no turning back. When I knew I was going to retire, I was on kickoff return playing for the Miami Dolphins. As the ball sailed over my head, I was telling myself I didn't want to be there anymore. So I ended up going to <laughs> – Back in the day, I wouldn't want to be on kickoff return in the way to either, buddy. I, I would, listen, I was on kickoff men return men. From, my fir- from the first game I played in the NFL to the last game I played. And then I had another year in my contract, and I went out to Hawaii – and I stayed there. I never came back. I served for five months, and I got down to 230 pounds. I had to convince myself and do something to let myself know when minicamp got here that I'm not I'm not minicamp ready. So I, I'm sure it's got to be different for you because you're always in shape. You always stay in shape. And, you know, I guess it's be harder to walk away f- for you than it was for me. Yeah, you know what's interesting is after I retired, it uh, goes back to Joni X's conversation of whether I kicked or not. Like when I made that decision, I stopped kicking and I really didn't really work out for three, four weeks because I wanted to give myself for the first time ever, I wanted my body to just recover. You know what I mean? As weird as that yeah. sounds, like, you know, even when I was kicking and I was still keeping the rigorous schedule like I normally would if I, if I were playing, you know, you're still grinding on your body. So, um, that part of it was really unique to be able to sit back and start putting a plan together to, you know, feel better. And I was in great shape when I played, that wasn't my issue. I always worked out. It was always in really good shape, probably almost too much. I think that's why I got hurt later in my career a lot. Cause I tried to do way more than I probably should have. Um, but that side of it for me was, was interesting to go through just to, to try to get my body back to being what I'll say is normal. 
it, Robbie, is there a best kicker that you envy uh, that you could just have the, you could close the books on one guy outside yourself that you feel, damn, this guy is a good kicker. Well, you know, one of the guys I always, I, and I was really lucky. I had Adam Vinatieri. Um, I, he's always been a mentor for me, even up to last year when, you know, I, I needed something to go through a workout routine. Hey, what did you do when you're 40? How do you get the next two or three years of your career? Uh, he was always been a great sounding board for me. And I, and, and I hope that young kickers have the opportunity to be able to utilize some of those resources. And Adam's been awesome. Um, if I were to tell you that one guy that has it all, uh, he has the mentality, he has the confidence, he has the leg strength, uh, he has the accuracy, he has every kick in the book, it's Justin Tucker. Yeah. I mean, you look at how he missed five field goals this year, but he still made the Pro Bowl. I mean, that's like unheard of, right? I mean, Harrison Bucker, I think, missed one field goal all year, and Justin Tucker is the guy going to the Pro Bowl. So that tells you kind of what the league thinks about him from a player's coach's uh, perspective. Um, but, but one guy that I would say that was pretty cool. Now, listen, we are totally polar opposites of kickers, right? He's a power kicker with accuracy. You know, I think I was more of a finesse guy, technique driven, hitting the same swing, trying to be Freddie couples in the driving range if I could on the field. Uh, but Justin Tucker is, he is one of the best, if not the best to ever do it. And Cairo Santos had a great year for the Bears. No question. Career yeah, high, 136 great... points, 35 of 38, and 31 of 33 extra points. And uh, he, he earned that extension uh, in his five years here. He's, he's 90.4 in his kicks, and he's adapted to Soldier Field. And he, too, uh, had injuries in his career that he's bounced back from, and he feels whole again. Yeah, listen, what he's been able to do here in Chicago is, is, un, is unbelievable. It's really remarkable. Um, you know, I, I got to give uh, Pat Scales a lot of credit. He's a guy who goes in the free agency every single year. They give him a one-year deal to yep. take <laughs> league minimum for half half the money, which, you know, he's a guy who is not only really good at snapping the football on field goals and a big reason why Cairo has the success that he has, uh, but he's done some really nice things in the punt game to, to help the team. Um, he's also done, a, I think, a really nice job of creating a lot of energy on special teams for that group. So um, what Cairo's done here, I mean, no one's done it ever. So um, to see him rebound and doing the things that, um, you know, I saw him do in a young part of his career in Kansas City, uh, it's great to see him finding his footing and finding a home in Chicago. 447 field goals made for the Chicago Bears. Robbie Gold, regular season, wow. regular season. Regular Big season. Number. Then you got By then you the got way, the playoffs. Cairo Cairo's never missed in the playoffs either. I just don't know how many field goals he has, but he's another guy who hasn't missed in the playoffs. See, to me, and we so, gotta wrap it up, but to me, okay, forget about conditions for a moment. Forget about the excellence that you have. It's the pr- playoff pressure, which, you know, as as Charles Tillman always conveyed to me, pressure breaks pipes. Uh I just yep. feel that you know, until you master and got to somehow conquer that, you know, you're, you're going to be in that area of gosh, hope I can do this. (laughs) That's the key. I'll tell you, you know, it's funny. Like I always believed and Tom, I'm sure you're the same way. I always believed that preparation was the key for me. What I did watching film, I knew every ounce of every player on field goal block. I knew exactly what they did. I would then go confirm it with a special teams coordinator hey, they do this, this is their best rusher, what do you expect in these situations, what should I do, right? So we already had the game plan, watch film together, go to kickoffs, the same thing. The returner carries the ball in this hand all the time. When he runs to the left, he carries in his left hand. So if we got to a situation, to Tom's point earlier, if you knew exactly what that guy was going to do, where he was going to line up, how does he shade where the T is on the field, like all my preparation for the week was the difficult part. Hmm. When I got the Sundays or Saturdays, I'll, ne- I'll never forget this. Like I was the most calm I had ever been. I had 13 years between Super Bowl appearances. And I went into that game for t- I had two weeks to prepare for the Kansas City Chiefs. Now I had some familiarity with Tobe, but I, I literally did as much research on these guys going back to college film, watching how they ca- caught punts. How did they – because there's a direct correlation to how a guy catches punts and where he muffs them 
uh, we did the same thing to Green Bay where when we had Hightower in San Francisco, we kicked off left because all that guy's kickoff return and or punt muffs came when he had to field the ball left. So he wasn't seeing the ball correctly going that way. He fumbles. We go up three scores. That game's basically over in the first half. So to me, you know, yes, there is a mental component to it of being to being a competitor, but there's also this preparation piece that if you know what's going to happen in front of you or you know what's going on, there's no questions. You're not questioning yourself. All you're doing is going to pregame and finding your rhythm and finding your game plan for the day. And sometimes that's harder, harder than other days. Um, but to me, that's how exactly you want to be playing with a clear mind. That, to me, is what separated me, I think, from other kickers in the playoffs. Appreciate it, Robbie. Great stuff. Uh, you really made special teams come to life. I saw something from Belichick uh, a long time ago. He, he spent like 30 minutes explaining the history of, of punters and kickers and how they came to be in the modern era, and uh, you got some great insight on, on special teams indeed. The Bears' all-time scoring leader, Robbie Gold, enjoying retirement, but uh, with one eye on the playoffs <laughs> for sure and the run yeah, to the no Super doubt. Bowl. Thank you, Robbie. Appreciate it. In that conversation right there when he's talking about how everything affected uh, the Buffalo kicker in terms of how they approached that field goal from a special team's defensive point of view at the line of scrimmage, that would have never even crossed my mind. That was great insight. Tyler Bass, the Buffalo kicker, missing from 44 yards, which many people call a chip shot. It's not a chip shot. No. <laughs> That's not a chip shot. But, boy, oh, boy, some really good detail right there. Listen, I, I think one of the interesting things about being able to talk to Robbie Gold, there's so many details of special teams that people don't think about because they, they happen in such an instance. But in that instance, there's hours of preparation that goes into that instance. So uh, I, I think you're fortunate to have a guy like that that's, been had, that's had such a long, successful career to talk about when the kickers play such an important role in the success or failure of these games. You mentioned Bears special teams coordinator Richard Hightower, who is with him in San Francisco. He is the head coach for the East team in the East-West Shrine game, Tommy. And uh, Northwestern quarterback Mike Kafka, the offensive coordinator of the Giants, will handle – the West squad, that game will be on Thursday, February 4th in Frisco, Texas. Dave Borgonzi is the defensive coordinator for the East team representing the Bears. And then in the Senior Bowl, Jim Dre will be working with the offensive line, the Bears tight end coach, uh, in the Senior Bowl with uh, that group on the American and National squad. I don't remember which one now offhand. but uh, So Bears uh, coach is getting involved in that. They're doing this more and more every year. I think it's a great thing. For coaches, they just get thrown together from different teams and here, now make it all work. That's kind of interesting listen, when you think about it. Listen, it's super important yeah. because they get insight and evaluation that some schools and some t coaches will not. When you get to see the way a guy carries himself in the locker room before practice or what he does after practice or the effort he gives during practice, Oh my gosh, I would love to have an opportunity to coach an all-star game to learn a little bit behind the scenes of these guys. Or just to see what your own capabilities are when you're put in that position, a position of, either as a coordinator or as a head coach. Uh, all right, so looking ahead to the weekend, first time in 20 years, a pair of three seeds has reached the championship games. Those three seeds happen to be the Detroit Lions and the Kansas City Chiefs. The last time that happened was 03. Carolina and Indy, but the last number three seed to advance and win a Super Bowl happened to be the 06 Colts against the Bears. Mm. That memory. Yuck. It, yuck. I don't even follow. I don't even follow seeding. I look at who's True, healthy, I know. Yeah. What positions are they the most stable? Where do they have the most vulnerabilities? Is it indoor, outdoor? Is it a warm weather team playing at a cold weather site? I think there's a lot more other elements that you can look at um, outside the, the seating of this process. The Lions run defense against San Francisco. Just curious because the, the, the only guy that ran for any kind of numbers better than 70 yards was Justin Fields against Detroit, 104 on November 19th. Can they be – are they able to stop what Christian McCaffrey and that group are going to do? I, I don't think so. Um, I think when you have a dominant pass rusher in Hutchinson, I think you can have a lot of focus 
on what you want to do to him specifically to open up your running game, to make sure that you don't give him the opportunity to rush the passer multiple times because that's what he's so good at. And with the versatility of their ball carriers, the different way they use their offense, I think that you can really, um, you know, stress the, the Detroit defense and possibly have some good running yards in this game. Vizzy Hard Seltzer, the official Hard Seltzer of the Chicago Bears. And when it's time to tackle some game day deals, then go with the grocer who's been a part of Chicago since 1899, Jewel Osco, the official grocery store of the Chicago Bears. Our remaining moments here, the NFL on CBS, the most watched NFL divisional playoff game ever, surpassed 50 million viewers, Kansas City and Buffalo. Overall, 40 million viewers plus digital, highest on record dating to 1988 for the divisional round. Uh, the NFL is is the king and will remain that way, Tommy. <laughs> that was crappy weather around most of the country. People weren't leaving their houses. They were sitting in front of the TVs, whether they're at a, a pizza shop or at home. So, I think they would have watched anyway. It's that popular. I, I, do, I do too, but there's certain perfect scenarios that are set up for – weekends like this uh we got to give a shout out to uh because in this town we love our superstars and we certainly love ryan sandberg the cubs yes superstar hall of famer uh there's a statue going up outside of wrigley this summer for ryan uh, on the anniversary of a game against uh st louis when he hit two homers off bruce Suter, ninth and tenth inning homers uh but diagnosed with prostate cancer he's he's getting that taken care of uh, but prayers in his direction. Tom, I'm sure you you ran into him many times. He was in your well, era. We did. Of... we did in the New Orleans game, Jeff. Yeah, we yeah, getting, yeah, yeah. We were yeah, doing right, our pregame right. Bears game right. day live. And he walked by and both of us with excitement said, hey, there's Ryan Sandberg. Right. And we stopped him and both of us introduced ourselves to him. And listen. But among you know, those 80s I... great athletes that we had here, you know, with the Bears, the Cubs, the Blackhawks and the Bulls, you know. Crazy. Hey, he's one of the famous 23s. Yes, he <laughs> of the guys that wear that number. My yes, gosh, he Ryan is. Sandberg is a is a you know just one of the most congenial men you ever meet, and he's just a, an all star beyond compare. And, and a reminder to us men: uh, make sure you you get your regular checkups and get that prostate number checked every single year, Tom Thayer. Game day snacking calls for good foods, chunky guacamole made with hot avocados, tomatoes, onions, cilantro, and a squeeze of lime juice. It's the perfect snack to watch while the Bears win. Score some today at your local grocery store. Game day is guac day. And again, thanks to Busy Heart Seltzer, the official heart seltzer of the Chicago Bears, and Miller Lite, our title sponsor of Bears Etc. here in the offseason. Any final thoughts before we let you go? Um, no, just uh, I really enjoy the opportunity to talk with Robbie Gold. We'll always remember him as a decorated Chicago Bear and a guy that uh, came aboard under some difficult circumstances and made a Hall of Fame career out of it. Sure did. For Tom Thayer and Robbie Gold, I'm Jeff Joniak. Our next Bears Etc. podcast comes to you next Wednesday. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe now. The Chicago Bears official app, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Bear down, everybody. <laughs>